Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Yeah, welcome to Northway. So pumped that you are here with us. As you know, we're kicking off a new series. We're going to study the book of Esther for the next 10 weeks. And let me just get this on record and out of the way. Esther is not a book just for women in women's ministry. It's not. Men, it's a book for all of us. And it's actually a book written for such a specific time as this very moment that we are living through. We're going to get to that today and for the next nine weeks. But before we do, I just want to highlight something big and important and awesome going on right now today at Northway. So this marks the official date this Sunday morning, right at nine o'clock. We had our first of like many, many gatherings. Our South Campus location is now officially meeting every single week. Can we celebrate that? Can we, can we thank God for what he's doing? So the Northway family just got bigger. We are now officially seven campuses. And I just got a text. There are more than 125 people meeting at St. David's in Peters Township area, officially seventh campus. We're so excited and humbled. And, and, and the reason why we do that, just in case you're ever wondering, like, so why are we adding? Why are we expanding? Because, because there are still many people who don't yet know and experience and follow Jesus. And on our watch, we're going to be a church that does something about that. And we believe God has called us to the south and God has called us in our future to the east of Pittsburgh. And we are so thankful to see him working and moving and gathering people in his name to reach more and more people through his name. So South Campus, we are so excited for you guys, pumped, and we are praying for you in this new endeavor. Well, as I mentioned, the book of Esther, it's actually one of my absolute favorites in the entire Bible. I love reading it. It's a phenomenal story. It's a beautiful tale. It's written about, get this, 500 years ago. It was written and it recorded uh, moments that happened in 480, right around there, BC. So if you add on the 30 years of Jesus living and then he was crucified, Easter happened about at 33 years of age. That's about 520 years ago. And it tells us the moments and the happenings of a specific group of Jews who were living in Persia. Now, in that time in the world, Persia was the world's superpower. We hear about this. We see this in movies. The king then, it was Darius the Great. And then during this time, it was King Xerxes. I love to use the Greek version of his name because it's much easier to pronounce for me. King Xerxes, you know that name. You've heard of that name. And it tells us the moments of of these Jews. Now, Now, it was about 100 years after the Jewish nation was exiled into Babylon. However, many had actually returned to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And if you know your Bible history, you're thinking of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. However, not all of the Jews went back to Jerusalem. And we don't know why, but we do know that many, a really good bit of people stayed in Persia. And Esther is the story of an attempted genocide of those Jews living in in Persia. It takes place in the capital city known of Susa. And if you know the book and if you know the narrative, you know that Esther is an orphan girl who's Jewish and amazingly so rises to the ranks and becomes queen of the greatest empire in the world at that time. And she intervenes through God's help on behalf of God's people to accomplish God's will and for God's glory. And the Jewish folks are saved. The eradication is thwarted. And and, and get this, the Jews get to live in in beautiful triumph in the world in that time. It's an amazing book of the Bible. I am encouraging every single one of us to read through this book. It's only 10 chapters. You can do it four or five times throughout this series. Did you know that, that there are a ton of resources available to help us in our Bible study, in our reading of the scriptures? It unlocks so much knowledge so much background. One of my favorite places to go whenever I'm studying a book of the Bible, when I'm prepping to teach and open up a series like this, I go to bibleproject.com. And I found this little graphic on there. It's an, it's an arc, an overview that helps you understand the, the narrative of the book of Esther and helps you see this great reversal that happens. Now, many of you are you're thinking right now, I can't read any of that. I know. Like like the whole goal of this was just to kind of whet your appetite and to get you to go search for this on bibleproject.com. And really my goal is to get you to read the Bible, to not not just let me teach this to you or let uh, the people who teach here at Northway teach to you, but let God speak to you as you open his word and as you read it. Check out bibleproject.com as you do. 
Now, as you read all 10 chapters, there are basically four primary characters that you're gonna bump into. Of course, there is Esther. She was this orphaned girl who, through a beauty pageant and amazing circumstances, rises, as I mentioned, to become the queen for such a time as this. There's also another Jewish character that you're going to meet. His name is Mordecai. And Mordecai is Esther's uncle. He actually adopted Esther and took her in to his household and cared for her. And you're going to hear about how Mordecai, amazingly so, at the very beginning of this book of the Bible, he hears about a plot to, to assassinate King Xerxes. And he shares that news with the king and ultimately saves the king life, king's life. Mordecai is an amazing man. And it's not just Jewish characters that we bump into in this book of the Bible. There's also two Persian characters. Of course, there's King Xerxes. I've mentioned him. King Xerxes loves to party. He loves to throw banquets. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie 300, and it's the story that uh, tells the tale of the Battle of Thermopylae, where Sparta took a stand against the, the evil empire of Persia. Well, King Xerxes, that's him in this movie. This is King Xerxes that we're reading about in the book of Esther. And then, of course, there's this fourth character, and he is ultimately the real villain in this story. His name is Haman. And Haman is, is this man that, that has an insatiable appetite for power, a lust for influence, a lust to be great and significant. And he will stop at nothing. And not only does he have this lust for power and significance, but Haman seems to have a hatred for the Jews. And so on his inevitable working and, and conniving ways to rise to the top, he, he creates a plan to kill all of the Jewish people in Persia. But of course, we know that that plan ultimately gets thwarted. Now, if you're wondering, so, so why all of these details and why the, the overview and why all of this background knowledge? Because I want us to understand like, like the, the movement and the action that leads to ultimately the ending of what we read about. And, and this is where this book starts to speak to us in our lives today. You see, at the end in chapter 9 and 10, as the action is all sort of settling down and the, and the story is sort of unfolding and, 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 and like landing its spot in, in history, you start to read about this feast that emerges. Mordecai establishes a feast for the Jewish people. You know that Jewish folks, they love feasts. It's a way of remembering the story of God and it's remembering who God is and what God does on behalf of his people. And in Esther chapter 9, we read about this feast called Purim. It's the Feast of Lots. In a way, it's similar to the Passover feast. The Passover re recollects and reflects about how God saved his people through the Exodus. Well, Purim is written and, and designed in a specific way to help the, the Jewish people remember something very, very specific. And I want to read for us in Esther chapter 9, the establishment of this feast. Here's what the author of Esther writes. And Mordecai recorded these things and he sent letters to all of the Jews who were in the provinces of King Assuerus. If you're wondering why I say Xerxes, that's why. Both near and far. Obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year as the days on which the Jews, they got relief from their enemies. And as the month that got them turned, that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them a day of feasting and gladness, day of sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. This is a day of remembrance. It's a feast to always remember who God is and what God does with feasting and with joy. Now, if you're wondering about this feast, it sounds like many of the different feasts that the Jewish people celebrate to this day, but there's something unique about this particular one, Purim. It was actually designed for a very specific audience, for people living in exile. Now, now, it was easy probably for the people right after this moment because they had Mordecai and they had Esther and she was the queen and there was always this symbol to help them remember uh, all that God had done. But, but after Esther and Mordecai passed away, when new generations started to emerge, this was a feast designed for them specifically to remember who God is and all that God does for his people. It was specifically designed for people living in exile. 
people living in a land that felt, at best, morally ambiguous and dark. People who, when they lived for God, felt like we're all alone and we stand out. And it's not normal to be living for God in this day and age. Does that sound at all familiar to what we experience today? Aren't we strangers living in a strange land? Isn't our citizenship ultimately in heaven and not here on earth? Doesn't it feel lonely sometimes to live for God? Doesn't it feel like when you look at the world, all you see at best is darkness and moral ambiguity? Esther is a book not only written for that specific audience, it's also written for us in such a time as this very moment that we are living through. It's a book that's designed to encourage us and point us to remember no matter what we face, no matter what rages in the world all around us, no matter who gets elected or who doesn't get elected, it's designed to encourage us to remember who God is and what God does, and that our hope is only ever to be placed in Christ alone. That's why this book matters. That's why we're studying this book right now. So here's what I want to do as we kick off our study and our exploration of this book. I want to point out uh, today in an overview three interesting details that matter to us. Here's the first one, and this is one that I'm guessing you could already have guessed. I, I write it this way. The central figure in the book of Esther is a woman named Esther. Bet you didn't see that one coming. I I think about that. Most of the books of the Bible, when you read them, the central human character is often a man. Abraham, David, King Solomon and Saul. You think about the prophets, Ezekiel and Isaiah and and Micah. But here we, much much like Ruth, we read the book of Esther and there is a woman who is the central figure. And I find that amazing and beautiful and necessary for us to read. Esther leads in an amazing way. She, She leads with patience. She leads with wisdom. She is very wise and shrewd in her timing. She leads prayerfully and she leads with boldness and she risks it all, not for herself, but for God's people and for God's story and for God's glory. She is an example to us all of what it looks like for women to lead and use their influence and their talents and their voice on behalf of God and his glory and for his people. To me, when I read the book of Esther, it encourages me and it reminds me that that God is using this book to demonstrate not only how he used, but also how he still uses today women to change the course of history by allowing and encouraging and needing them to to step up and use their voice and leverage their influence and, and use their talents on his behalf. Ladies, that should be encouraging to all of us. It should be. God has designed you to lead and to leverage your voice and your influence and your talents. And it should, it, it should not only be encouraging to the ladies, but it should also be encouraging to us as men. This is the way God works. And this is also what our world needs to see and experience. Northway is a place where women are encouraged to lead. Women are needed to lead. So lead. So step up. Continue to step up. Continue to take the influence God has given you, the voice God has put inside of you, the talents God has equipped you with, and don't use them for yourself or just for your family. Use them for God's family. Because when you read the book of Esther, you're going to see she didn't really have a personal agenda. She wasn't seeking personal fame and personal wealth. She was leading self, selflessly and self-sacrificially on behalf of God's people. Esther is an incredibly encouraging book. However, if all we get from the book of Esther is that this is one of the places in the Bible where God demonstrates that he uses women to lead, then I think we're missing part of the point. Because in the book of Esther, there's a man who leads as well. In the same way, Mordecai very wisely and selflessly and prayerfully and with great patience and with great timing does the same thing as Esther. He leads on behalf of God's people 
to help them understand the way God works and all that God does. Mordecai steps up and leads with his influence and with his voice and with the talents and the gifts that God has placed inside of him. You see, sometimes we think that the main character in the book of Esther is Esther or, or maybe it's Mordecai and it's not. The main point of Esther is for us to see God, not humans. And God uses us and our voices and our influence and our talents to help the world see and understand him. And what the world needs right now is men and women leading together, side by side. Brothers and sisters in Christ, self, selflessly leading on behalf of God with their influence and with their voice and with their talents so that the world may know who God is and what God does. That's what I get when I read the book of Esther. This encouragement not to compete with the other gender, but to be complete with the other gender and lead together. See, I believe that was God's design in the very beginning. When you read in Genesis, when you see about God creating a woman from Adam's rib, you start to see a different picture of what ultimately is going on. You start to see God using not competition, but completion as the strategy. Then the Lord God said, this is Genesis chapter two, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. You know, a lot of times we misconstrue and we abuse that word helper. At least we have throughout history. That word does not signal subservience or less than. It signals something different. In the Hebrew, that word is ezer kenegdo, and it's Hebrew for helper, but it's also a word that's used to describe God throughout the scriptures. And make no mistake, God is never less than any of us. God is never below us on the ladder. It, it does mean and communicate helper, but it also, it creates a picture of opposite to and next to and face to face as a counterpart. See, there's a reason I believe God took it from Adam's side, from his rib, so we could get a picture of us leading together. Husbands and wives, if you're ever wondering, like, like how, how's the best way for us to function in marriage? Read Ephesians chapter five. It's the image and picture of mutual submission out of reverence for Christ, not for yourself, not for your own pleasures, not for your own desires. It's out of love for Christ. It's azer connecto. It's side by side, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I know Esther and Mordecai, they, they were related as uncle and niece, and it's not necessarily marriage, but it shows us what this can look like. I wanna, I wanna read for us an exchange that happened between Esther and Mordecai so you can start to get a picture of what this looks like. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said, and then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Don't think for that to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all of the Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Mordecai is holding Esther accountable. He's speaking the truth in love. He's leading. And Esther is hearing. And then she leads as well. And who knows whether or not you've come to this kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it's against the law. She risked it all on behalf of God and his people and his glory. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther ordered him to do. Do you see the picture there? That's mutual submission. And that's what our world needs to see from the body of Christ right now. Think about it. It's 2024. The signs are all over our neighborhoods in the yards. We're about to enter an election season where it just gets divisive and it gets bitter and it gets finger pointing and it gets so prideful and it gets so sided and divided. And what the world needs to see when it grows darker and darker and darker is the light of Christ shining through men and women who lead side by side with their voice and their influence and the gifts and talents that God has placed inside of every single one of us. We need this book right now more than ever. And it should encourage us and direct our steps for such a time as this. There's more. 
There's more interesting details when I read uh, the book of Esther. You can see it clearly as the action builds. And if you look at BibleProject.com, you'll see that arc and you'll, you'll see that it is clear there is a contest a battle going on of cosmic forces. There is a clear cut clash of worldviews at play throughout the book of Esther. You know, I mentioned that Haman is the real villain in this book. And Haman sort of represents the, the opposite side, the opposing force to God in this book of the Bible. Haman believed and worshiped many gods. Haman practiced magic. Haman is someone that put his life and his trust in fate. Haman believed that gods could be manipulated through his own wisdom and, and sly and slick ways. Haman was a force that was the opposite or in opposition of what the Jews believed. Because the Jews only worshiped one God, Yahweh. The Jews didn't believe in fate. They had faith in God. They didn't believe God could be manipulated. They understood that God is sovereign. Do you see this clash going on? Do you see opposing forces? Don't you see that in our world today as well? You see, we live in an era that, that has been labeled boldly post-Christian. Well, no longer does the Bible hold its place as a source of truth. No longer are the values that we get from the example and teaching and ministry of Jesus Christ as the way we live our lives and train our children. We live in a very different era. We are living, make no mistake, in the middle of opposing forces in a clash of worldviews. And Esther shows us a way to live through this clash and not only live through it and endure it, and endure it but to stand and be victorious despite it. If, if you're still wondering, like, what, what do you mean by this clash of worldviews? Check this out. I, I thought this would be a great way to demonstrate what I'm talking about, about opposing forces. So I grew up in, in the 80s and the 90s. And my, my favorite athlete as, as a boy, and really still to this day, Michael Jordan, like greatest of all time. I loved Michael Jordan. Of course, he went to the University of North Carolina. He has that going for him, for me. I'm a huge fan of the Tar Heels, but, but he was just phenomenal. And I remember like watching what he did and, and doing what he did. And of course, I remember all the commercials that he was in. And if you know, he was a spokesperson for Gatorade. And if, and if in your mind right now, you're thinking what I'm thinking, you're thinking like Mike, if I could be like Mike. Remember those commercials? Check that out. This is the image of that. This is Mike repping Gatorade. And, and the idea was that greatness is to try and be like someone else. Now, think about that today. Recently, Tom Brady released a commercial with him and Morgan Freeman. And the commercial had a little bit of a different message. It was this example of Tom Brady writing a letter to a young boy. And he told this young boy, don't ever compare yourself to anyone but the person you see in the mirror. Meaning greatness, it's already in you. You don't have to look to anyone else. Do you see the clash? Do you see the opposing ideas there? It's presented through commercials. See, truth according to the Bible, it's not subjective. Truth is found in Jesus Christ alone. And if we want to know the way, the truth, and the life, we don't look inside. We look outside of us. We look to Jesus, and He is our standard, and He is our source, and our values, and our lives, and our decisions, they are anchored in Christ alone. But in our world today, that's not the message that's being conveyed to our kids and to us subtly through our media. It's telling us truth is within you. Truth is whatever you feel it is. Truth is whatever you think it is today. Truth is subjective. Don't let anyone else tell you what true is. Now, do you see that going on in our world? That's the battle we face today. Our world is very much the same as the world Esther and Mordecai were living through. But here's the deal. When you look at this book of the Bible, you start to see it emerge, the way in which we're supposed to live despite this clash that's going on. You see, when you read the story, all 10 chapters, you're gonna see that Esther and Mordecai they didn't submit to a spirit of fear. They didn't retreat. They didn't just hole up in the closet and pray that it would all go away. No, they took a stand and they entered the fray of their world and they lived boldly by biblical standards of conduct, no matter the cost. And they show us exactly what to do in our lives today. Read this book of the Bible. It will encourage us of what can happen 
if we stand on God's word for our life. I read this book and I see Mordecai serving faithfully and honoring the leadership that he is under. He spoiled a plan to kill an evil king because that was the right thing to do to preserve life. I also see Mordecai later on when there was a rule created about worshiping this king, he refused to bow down. He lived in an uncompromising way saying, God's word is most important and it's my ultimate standard of conduct. You're also gonna read about Esther and I did just a few minutes ago. Esther, what did she do when she had a decision to make and she was struggling and there was some risk involved? She prayed and she fasted. And she called people to pray and to fast alongside of her. Prayer is our strategy as followers of Jesus when we're trying to navigate a clash of worldviews. Prayer is our strategy when it comes to raising our kids in a morally ambiguous and dark world. Prayer is our strategy no matter what we face and no matter what rages all around us. We see that in Esther. And finally, when you look at Esther, you see her being bold, not being afraid. You know, the very idea of requesting an audience with the king brought with it the potential to be executed, even if you were the queen. And Esther, because she felt like this is what God was leading her to do. She felt like this is what her people needed her to do. She felt like this is what would bring God glory and advance his story. She made the ask and she risked it all. And she went before the king. And ultimately you saw God move. See, Esther is a book. When you look at Esther and Mordecai, you see what it looks like to be faithful. You see what it looks like to be honoring. You see what it looks like and you see this call and you hear it to be uncompromising no matter what everyone else around us is doing. You see this call to be bold, to be selfless. And most of all, you see a call to be prayerful at all times and with all types of prayers. This is an encouraging book for such a time as this. And it helps us understand how to take a stand without shrinking back and without stepping away, but being light in a really, really dark world. Here's the third thing that I see when I read the book of Esther, all 10 chapters. And this is the one that I found, gosh, this was, this was the most interesting to me and a little bit shocking. You'll notice when you read the book of Esther, no matter how hard you try to put this word in the text, it's not found there. You see, all throughout all 10 chapters of the book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned one time. Isn't that crazy? In a book of the Bible, God's name is never mentioned once. But yet as you read it, there is no doubt you will see his hand all the way through it. It's almost like the author was intentionally trying to leave God's name out to encourage people that whenever you don't see or feel God's hand, you can still trust that he's present and working on your behalf. That's why this book matters for such a time as this. The author wanted us to understand the mystery of God's hand working at all times, all throughout history on behalf of his people, even if his name isn't mentioned. The author wants to develop within us as God's people, eyes of faith, not eyes of fear. And that will happen when you read the book of Esther. You will start to get a sense of the way God works and and who God is and what God does on behalf of God's people. It's an encouraging book. Yet there are critics of this book of the Bible. The critics out there will tell you that the book of Esther is way too convenient. Gosh, it's way too like, wow, that, that almost feels like a fairy tale. It feels like, man, that is improbable that all those things would happen in those ways, in that order, and for those people. And the word that critics use most when they describe the book of Esther is that it's just a coincidence. But you know, as God's people, as followers of Jesus who know him, who experience him every single day, and who are following him to the best of their ability, coincidence is not the word we use when we talk about God and his ways. We call it providence. The world will tell you to call it a coincidence, but stay away from that because that is not a word when it comes to God. God, through the eyes of faith, shows us his providence in our lives, and we can always trust and know that he is faithful to complete the good work that he began in every single one of us. Like, think about it. Is, it. is it coincidence or was it providence that Queen Vashti, 
the queen before Esther, that she refused to go and see the king and therefore lost her place and her position. Was that coincidence or providence? Was it coincidence or providence that Mordecai, even before this man, Haman, this villain, is revealed in the text, that Mordecai revealed the plot and saved the king's life, therefore storing up a little bit of credit that he would cash in on later on in the book of Esther. Coincidence or providence? Is it coincidence or providence that Esther, this Jewish girl, this this stranger in a strange land, became the queen through a beauty pageant? Coincidence or providence? And is it coincidence or providence that Esther went in to see the king and received permission to do something that often would lead to death. Finally, is it coincidence or providence that Haman, who built some gallows to ultimately have Mordecai killed upon, ends up getting murdered and killed on the very gallows that he himself built with his own hands. And that the whole story and everything he desired was reversed. And it was given to Mordecai and Esther and the Jewish people. Coincidence or providence? Eyes of fear or eyes of faith? See, as you read this book, God is going to develop in every single one of us eyes of faith to understand how God works and who he is and what he's doing. Mark Batterson, who was here just a couple of weeks ago at our family conference, he shared something that I'm still chewing on and I'm still trying to process and learn through. He said that many times in our life, when we're looking for God to do something in in our specific lives, we sort of count up. We count the days about how long it's taking. Lord, I wanna wanna get this in my life. And Lord, I wanna achieve this in my career. Lord, I need this in my finances. And we count up. It's been one week. It's been 10 weeks, it's been a year, it's been three years, and we are always counting up, adding up how long it takes. But in God's world, eyes of faith, we understand because of his providence and his nature and his faithfulness, God is never counting up. He's always just counting down for the exact right time so that his glory and his story and his will can be revealed on the earth in our lives and for the world around us. God is saying 10, 9, Eight, seven, six. He's doing it on behalf of the Jewish people in the book of Esther. And he's doing it on behalf of us right now for such a time as this, because God is always providential to his people. Just last week, it was, it was Easter break for my, my oldest son who is off to college. And man, we had, a, we had a blast. The services here at Northway were phenomenal. I'm so excited at, at, at the way everything turned out. But, but even more than that, in our family, we had this we had an amazing weekend together because Nico brought three friends home with him from college and they, they showed up at our house Wednesday night and they stayed all the way through Monday afternoon. And, and I'll tell you what, those kids can eat a lot of food. <laughs> one boy ate nine tacos in one meal. And like we were, we were like making food and cleaning up and then just making food again. And I tell you what, Brooke and I loved every single minute of it because this is what we've prayed for. You know, if you're a mom or dad, you understand how important friends are in your kids' lives. And the prayer of our heart has always been that, that whenever Nico gets into college, like, you know, high school happens and there's really good friendships there, but everybody sort of goes off in their, in their own direction and to their own schools. And when Nico got to college, we've always been praying that he would be surrounded by friends who love Jesus, who loved him for who Nico was and who allowed him to just be himself around them and who would point him no matter what in these formative years of college to know and experience and follow Jesus. And here we were on this weekend making food over and over and over again. And you know what I heard? Five, four, three, two, one. It was God's providence. It was an example of how God has answered prayer on our behalf at just the right time. We wished it would have been answered three years ago or two years ago or a year ago. And we could think about how it would have been easier if it would have been answered then, but no, it's sweeter when it's answered now because this is God's perfect timing for our son. And God wants every single one of us to have a story just like that to understand with eyes of faith that even if we don't see him, he's here. He's never absent. He's always present. He's for you. He's with you. And he's working and he's counting down for just the right moment. Moms and dads, keep praying. Keep praying for your marriage. Keep praying for your kids. Keep praying for your church. 
Keep praying for that thing and trust with eyes of faith that God is moving and God is present. I have no doubt in my mind that this book was written for such a time as this. It's designed to call us not to division, but, but to unity as men and women leading together in a dark world. It's a book that's designed to help us understand that God's providence is all through our story and we can trust him with eyes of faith. And it's a book that's designed to help us understand what it means and looks like to take a stand and not shrink back in the middle of a clash of opposing forces and to trust that God always wins. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Heavenly Father, those are things that I need to hear and see and feel in my life. So God, as we go through this story as a church collectively, will you show us them? Or will you show us them um, specifically in, in our own lives? Show us what it means to lead together. Show us what it means to look like to stand despite a clash of opposing forces. And God, show us what it means to live and lead with eyes of faith and not eyes of fear. God, we need your help for such a time as this. And we thank you for a book like Esther that not only encourages us, but it also emboldens us to know you, to experience you, and to follow you. We dedicate this entire learning experience and teaching series to you and ask you to speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and the entire church said, amen. amen. Hey, I love you all. Thanks for being here this morning.